Godzilla 2014 is property of Legendary Pictures and Toho Company Limited. This is a fan-made movie review. Please support the official release. Hey everybody, Godzilla419 here. I know y'all have waited almost an entire year for this. This is my Godzilla 2014 review. Yay! Anyway, um, we're gonna get right right into this movie. Like, yeah, yeah, this is kind of a crappy movie, so y'all just you know have to sit through it, dude. What do you mean crappy movie? This is a pretty good movie, dude. You you actually like this? You stay right there, Titanosaurus. Well, she um, just gonna have to ask you um, what do you think, Titanosaurus plushie? Do I like this movie? Okay, you got a lot of merch, but this still wasn't that great a movie. Titanus Wars Plushie, how about you let me talk about this movie, and then we can make our decision at the end. Alright, that sounds fair. Alright, everybody, so this is Godzilla 2014. Alright, so, the movie starts off with this wonderful, kind of like, old black and white newsreel kind of footage. Really awesome, kind of introducing us to the idea of Monarch, and, you know, backstory for Godzilla, and it's just... It looks awesome and ends with this big nuclear explosion they're using to try to kill Godzilla, which leads into our title screen. Love it, simplistic, it's... I, I, I love it. Anyway, we start off in the Philippines, 1999, where some miners tr um, digging for what they thought was uranium hit an underground cavern. And it collapses in on them, and you know, bad stuff happens. But we meet, we're introduced to the Monarch team led by Dr. Sherazawa, played by the incredible Ken Watanabe. He and his Monarch team descend into the cavern and find the fossil remains of a huge creature, as well as what look like two egg cases or cocoons. One of them seems to have split open and released a creature which broke through the side of the cavern and, cre and just headed down towards the ocean, creating this huge trench. Amazing that nobody noticed this before now. Yeah. Anyway, we head off to Japan, where we are introduced to our hero in his younger days, Ford Brody. And amazingly, this is probably the best child actor in the whole movie. And basically, he ha he wants to surprise his dad for his birthday, and unfortunately, his dad is already up and busy. His dad is Brian freaking Cranston. <laughs> yeah, I know. And he's really concerned about these tremors that are heading towards his nuclear power plant. And so he's kind of busy with that. He's barely paying attention to his wife, who's trying to tell him, hey, it's your birthday, your son wanted to do a surprise, so act like you're surprised when you get home today. Anyway, she also works at the nuclear power plant. She's going down into the um, maintenance tunnels to see if she can do anything to, you know, uh, if there's any problems down there. All the while, there are another, a couple more tremors hit, and it actually causes a breach, and Cranston has to um, close the the um, containment doors to keep the, sm the this smoke coming out. And I've heard people laughing like, oh, well, they're afraid of smoke, la 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 la. Well, here's the thing. A nuclear reactor works this like this. You have the nuclear material creating an insane amount of heat, boiling a huge vat of water that creates steam. This steam turns a turbine, producing electricity. That's why when you see a nuclear power plant, you see smoke coming out of the top. That's steam. But, but if there's a breach and the water actually comes into physical contact with the nuclear material, it irradiates the steam, causing, uh, basically, if you breathe in this steam, you just breathe, breathe in like all these nuclear radioactive particles that will kill you. So yeah, you should be scared. Anyway, the whole plant is collapsing, and really, things are just up go up the creek without a paddle right now. Cut to 15 years later to the present day, or at least a present day a year ago, and we meet Ford, Ford, Ford now, 
or Aaron Taylor Johnson, as I like to call him, and get used to this face, because for the last two-thirds of this movie, that's the exact face he's going to make. Completely expressionless, like a piece of wood. Anyway, apparently he's a soldier now, and he's on leave. He's going back home. And him and his wife actually have some pretty good chemistry. He's actually emoting really well with her. But their kid is awful. The, the child actor playing him plays like a badly written kid. Because he's just as wooden as um, Aaron Taylor Johnson is for the most part. But anyway, they get a call from Japan. Apparently his dad's in jail because he tried to break into the quarantine zone where their old neighborhood is. And he has to fly there and bail him out. So, Cran so Aaron Taylor Johnson bails Cranston out of jail. And he's basically saying, Dad, you need to stop being crazy. And his dad's like, I'm not crazy. I can prove it. I've been echolocation. And, you know, I've been finding the signal again. It's exactly the same as it used to be. If I can get my old notes, I can prove I'm not crazy. To which Aaron Taylor Johnson's like, okay, I'll help you. And then we're going home. You're, this is it. If this doesn't prove, prove you're right, then we're gone. Well, they get into the quarantine zone in their old neighborhood, and lo and behold, there is no radiation anywhere. So they make their way to their old house, and we get this cool little monster shout out. And Cranston finds his old discs. He has all the old data he needs to prove that he's not crazy. And Aaron Taylor Johnson finds one of his old army men toys. And they basically figure out, hey, something's going on at the old nuclear plant. They're rebuilding something. And then they get caught by Muda, by um, Monarch Security and taken in, to question it, and taken in for questioning at the old plant, which is now the Monarch base. And they, Cranston gets a peek at this thing. This odd thing. Yes, this thing is the answers to all of his questions, the proof that he's not crazy. He just wants to know what it is, but he also wants to know that his son is safe. And we get this awesome scene where he just steals it away. There, he's in like what is essentially a um, broom closet almost, and they're trying to interrogate him, but he won't have none of it. He's like, I know that you're hiding something. I want to talk to my son. This is just like 15 years ago, and... And the lights flicker on and off, and he's like, "See that? That's a new, that's an EMP, just like 15 years ago. Whatever this is, is gonna send us back to the Stone Age." And it is awesome, dude. Cranston is an amazing actor. Well, the, the Monarch team's like, "Yeah, he's right. We gotta stop this. You know, we have to kill it before it." Another incident happens like 15 years ago, so they try to frag the thing, you know, fry it with some electricity. Unfortunately, that doesn't work, and it ha and it and the creature bursts from its shell, and be and sends out another EMP. This luckily frees Cranston, who because of the electronic lock on the door that he was in the, to the broom closet gets released, but and he actually makes it out to see the thing. Unfortunately, he looks like he gets killed while the thing is trying to get out of the hole that it's in. And at this point, Aaron Taylor Johnson sort of kind of stops showing emotion. I, you know, I might, you might think, oh, well, he just looked into the face of a kaiju. What do you expect? Well, yeah, yeah that's kind of a lousy reason. Anyway, we get to see our first uh, the first good look at the new kaiju, and I have to say I am not overtly happy. You know, it's not a bad design, but I think it suffers way too much from what I call Cloverfield Monster Syndrome. Long spindly arms, you know, multiple limbs, tiny little head, and just in general an uninspired design. I mean, it's not... It, I, I I hate to say that it's unimaginative, but it's more like it's not iconic. Other kaiju have iconic looks. This just looks like something really generic to me. But either way, it's still a it's still an inter interesting monster, and gotta love it. Anyway, Monarch has, is forced to hand over situational control to the U.S. military. And unfortunately, Cranston was hurt so bad, and he ends up passing away. 
which is really unfortunate. He was the best character in the movie. Anyway, we learn that the creatures are called Mutos, and uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson gets some exposition to him um, by the Monarch crew, telling him about Godzilla and the Mutos, and they want to know what um, Brian Cranston knew, what his dad knew, and he can only he starts telling him about some some stuff about echolocation and calls, so so that's what they look into, and they basically say, okay, um, we're going to send you to Hawaii, you can hop a plane back to Los Angeles and be with your family again. Well, while in Hawaii, he gets on this airport tram and gets stuck with this little kid who wanted his um, little army man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that could sound really awkward, depending on how you want to listen to it. But basically, this kid got separated from his parents, and he's like, okay, I'll bring you around back to your parents. All the while, a nuclear sub went missing. Guess who stole that? Yes, the Mudo. It's basically eating the, nu the nukes out of the sub. And a, the military tries to scramble some aircraft to fight it, but Nuclear Pulse knocks them out of, their, out of the air, as well as knocking out everything in the city, including the tram at the airport that, Air that Aaron Taylor Johnson and the kid are on. But all the while... Something has been coming, and he is big. And Mudo kind of makes his way into the city. He basically into the into the airport and attacks the tram as power starts coming back on. But um, and Aaron Taylor Johnson and the kid manage to survive, just barely by the skin of their teeth, as he arrives on the scene. Yes. The Godzilla, a real Godzilla, shows up. This is Godzilla. And then they sort of cut. I guess they didn't want to blow their load all on uh, a little fight in the middle where it would just end up with the little Muto running away. Which, I guess you could call that a decent decision. But we do get to see um, video of the fight on TV in the movie. Yay. <laughs> Anyway, Aaron Taylor Johnson manages to get the kid back to his family, and then uh, manages to hitch a ride with the military. Being a um, being military man himself, he's basically like, "Hey, what can I do?" But this sort of starts his whole spiel of hitching a ride everywhere. He's never, <laughs> nobody's ever taking him somewhere. He's like, "Hey, can I come with?" Anyway, there's a, oh, a big powwow. Um, Watanabe is talking with the military, and they're trying to figure out what this call was, and they basically determine, well, it wasn't a call to Godzilla, it must have been to something else, and they're like, it was that other spore, the other egg. Well, where did you put it? Well, they, of course, they put, put it in Yucca Mountain Nuclear Waste Repository, you know? You know where we store all our nuclear waste, because, you know, it's pretty safe. And they're like, well, there shouldn't be anything left. We dissected it. We vivisected it. It's all cut up. Well, as they're going by, uh, a, a by um, vault by vault, which is kind of weird, and you'd think they'd have better organization of their nuclear waste, they find that one, one of the vaults has the back broken out of it. it when this something broke out, and there's a big old trackway behind it, Again, you'd think that they'd have kept a better eye on the nuclear repository where nuclear wastes and other deadly things are stored, and that somebody would have noticed this as soon as it happened. But nope. Of course, this creature is heading straight through Las Vegas, so they're screwed. Anyway, Wananabe and Monarch um, determined that the reason that these two creatures are looking so different is because of some sort of sexual dimorphism that one must be a male, one must be a female, and they're heading towards each other to breed, which is going to be a huge problem. The military is like, okay, well, if they're attracted to nuclear material, we'll take a nuke, a modern nuke, use it to attract them, Godzilla will follow them, and we'll blow all three of them up. And this, uh, and Wontanami's like, no, we need to let Godzilla handle this. He's the alpha predator. He can handle it. Anyway, Aaron Taylor Johnson again hitches another ride in with the train carrying the nukes because he's a bomb disposal specialist. 
and he can help uh, retrofit these modern digital nukes to be analog so they won't be affected by the EMP. And basically he wants to get into the city so he can get to his family. And he manages to get a call to his wife who's really upset. She's like, oh baby, I miss you, I love you. And Aaron Taylor Johnson's like, yes baby, I miss you. Uh, yeah. Completely like an emotional brick. Anyway, so, you know, maybe he, that's his son, his son is acting like a, like a piece of wood to be like his daddy, who's also a piece of wood emotionally. Anyway, as they're on the train, they run into the female Mudo, and we see that she indeed does have a giant egg sack. And she basically attacks the train, eats all but one of the nukes that they were carrying. Oh, it's a good thing she left one. Because as they come to pick it up, they also pick up Aaron Taylor Johnson, hitching another ride. So back in San Francisco, they're evacuating, and Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Brody is basically puts her son on a bus and says, "Listen, they're going to take you out of the city. You'll be safe in a shelter. Mommy has to stay here and help the patients." which he is incredibly calm about. Seriously, he's on a bus full of a bunch of other children who are acting like children, screaming and hollering and, you know, being kids because they don't really understand what's going on. And he's standing there like, completely calm. I must be concentrate. Meditation. <laughs> and then Godzilla appears as they're on the bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge. Now, I've heard people give so much crap about this scene. They're like, oh, why do they call Godzilla at the end a good guy when, when he goes and he kills all these people on the bridge? Godzilla didn't do jack squat in the, uh, to the people on these bridge. bridge. Because here's, here's the thing. Godzilla in this movie is 108 meters tall. That, If you want to put that into feet, that's 354.331 feet. Now, at its deepest, the water at the Golden Gate Bridge is a little more than 300 feet. As we can see, because Godzilla is standing up in the water, the water isn't more isn't very much past his his waist, and probably not even that deep at some, at certain points. So basically, it's 150 maybe feet deep. There's no way he could have swim swam under it. And then he's standing there looking around, and he gets shot at, and it's like, it's, you know, it doesn't bother him, he's just like swatting, it's like bugs just landing on him, and he's like, uh, what the hell, uh, he just kind of lumbers forward into water, and, and, and into the actual bay itself, which, on average, is just 14 feet deep. So yeah, unless he went around, Godzilla was going to have to break through that bridge. Stop bitching about it. Anyway, unfortunately the male Mudo attacks the um, ship where they were planning on um, keeping the nuke for right now. The plan was to take it 20, 20 miles offshore and have it blow and take out all three creatures. That wasn't going to happen, unfortunately. The male just completely ruins that plan. But then we get this sort of touching moment where he presents his trophy of a fresh nuke to his new mate as food for their soon-to-be-born children. It's kind of sweet. Anyway, the military knows um, everything's hit the fan right now, so they have to ha they have a new plan: either disarm the nuke or get it out of the city, because. Is, if this thing blows in the city, there's several about 200,000 people that are going to die. And the only way in is to parachute in. They, they can't get any vehicles in because of the EMP pulses. And Watanabe and the general have a little talk, and he's like, yeah, let Godzilla handle this, let them fight. So we cut to the male Mudo flying through the city as we see that some idiots decided to go to work today instead of evacuating. It seems like they are tr they're reevaluating their decisions. Now Godzilla pops up, and the long drawn out fight between the Mudos and Godzilla begins. And we get the actual halo drop into the city. And gotta admit, this is an awesome scene. The ambiance, the m music, everything is just like 
perfect. These, it's like these guys are literally diving into a hellscape of monsters and mortal combat, and they're the only hope for the city blow to save it from nuclear Armageddon. And as they're heading towards the nuke, Godzilla kind of peers out of the, uh, the, uh, the smoke and the dust, letting loose a challenging roar to the female Mudo who's still at the nest. And she's, she responds by rushing forward to protect her, her freshly laid eggs. And she just barrels into Godzilla. And the soldiers and Aaron, Aaron Taylor Johnson um, find the nuke. And it's covered with eggs. And they, they try to get to the controls of the nuke so they can disarm it. And unfortunately they can't, so they detach the warhead and start carrying out. They're going to go try to put it on a boat. At the, at, all the while, Godzilla is locked in combat with a female Amudo, and she is no match for him one-on-one. -on -one. But then the male appears to aid his mate, and with a two-on-one battle, Godzilla starts losing ground. He's being overwhelmed by these two creatures. Back at the nest, Aaron Taylor Johnson before he leaves, he's like, okay, we gotta stop, uh, do something about all these eggs. So he breaks open a tanker truck full of gasoline. And there's little fires going around everywhere. So as soon as the gasoline hits one of these fires, it causes a huge explosion that frags all the eggs and draws the female from the fight. To And she wants to check on her eggs. And Mama Mudo is none too happy, and she's locking eyes with Aaron Taylor Johnson when all of a sudden there's a strange blue glow. Oh, yeah. It's gonna happen. Oh, yeah! Oh, hell yes. Seriously, this is it, man. I mean, it's iconic. Godzilla, his trademark nuclear, uh, fire, nuclear breath. I mean... Oh, yeah! 98 can suck it, man. This is Godzilla. And he is letting the female Mudo have it, just pounding her with his atomic breath. But um, the male manages to pop in and save the female just in time. And uh, as this is going on, the rest of the soldiers have gotten ahead of Aaron Taylor Johnson and are bringing the nuke to a boat that they found. But, um... Mama Mudo is after them. She's sort of noticed noticed them, so she's following them. And while she's going after them, Godzilla's fighting with the male. And in one incredibly awesome move, he uses Tail Whip. I bet you thought that was a useless move that Pokemon learned really early and you deleted it, but it's not. <laughs> but no, he uses his tail to smash the male Mudo into the side of the building, into the side of a building, literally crushing it to death. And then we get to see Godzilla, and he is tired from being in combat for nonstop for like an hour or so, because you know this is movie time we're talking about here. And he's feeling old. He's Obviously, this Godzilla has been around for more than 60 years, and even then, he was a fully mature Godzilla when they first discovered him. He is old, he's tired, he's been beaten down a lot. No, he looks like he's on his last leg. All of a sudden, the building that he smashed the male Mudo in falls on top of him. And as Godzilla falls to the ground, Aaron Taylor Johnson looks into his face, and there's you can actually see the tired feeling in Godzilla's face. It's so expressive, it kind of pains me that the CGI Godzilla's face is more expressive than Aaron Taylor Johnson at this point. And it, anyway, it's like this is his last moment This is, that he's done. Well, there's no time for Aaron Taylor Johnson to ponder this. He needs to head down there to help his fellow soldiers. And the boat is under the attack by the female Mudo, and she kind of knocks everybody off of it. And she, he and she then gets uh, starts attacking the soldiers that are still on the shore. Aaron Taylor Johnson uses this uh, momentary distraction to get on the boat, and he's able to get the boat started up on its you know automated GPS autopilot. And he's heading out to sea when all of a sudden another EMP hits shutting everything down. 
And there she is, angry Mudo Mommy, right above him. This is the end for him. Not nah, because Godzilla is still there. He's coming there. He attacks her from behind, just grabs onto her, and then he gives an ultimate finishing maneuver, grabbing her jaws and firing his atomic breath once again straight down her throat, decapitating the monster and claiming his total victory. And as the boat heads out to sea, um, as the everything kicks back on. Um, Aaron Taylor Johnson passes out and he sees Godzilla do the same he falls to the ground is he dead? And was the battle really too much for him? well, as the boat is heading out to sea a helicopter appears and they manage to extract Aaron Taylor Johnson just in time and we see in the distance the nuke exploding safely out at sea they saved everyone the next morning, Aaron Taylor Johnson's there with his son, both of them looking like boards, and they're looking for his wife. In the meantime, we find that Godzilla is still alive. He opens his eyes and he's getting back up. And Aaron Taylor Johnson's wife shows up, and they have sort of this weird kiss, uh, unexpressive kiss on his end, and she's really emoting everything. And we cut to this, uh, onto the big screen. Godzilla, king of the monsters, savior of our city. Of course, there's a question mark at that end, but, you know, still. And, pe and I, people bitched about the king of the monsters, savior of our city, with the question mark at it. Again, I explained why about the bridge and the fact that he just killed two monsters that were trying to overrun the city with baby monsters. I guess they, and I'm pretty sure that some people um, found out about everything that was going on, especially about the nuke that um, they wouldn't have been able to recover if Godzilla hadn't been there and it would have blown up the entire city. So yeah, people quit your bitching because he is the king. All hail to the king, baby. Yeah. And that's basically the end of the movie. And so there we have it. Godzilla 2014, a, f a fairly decent movie overall. Dude, how can we even call this a Godzilla movie? He was barely in it. Okay, yeah, that's sort of one of the biggest complaints I've heard. Yeah, how can a Godzilla movie not have Godzilla in it? Come on, people. Well, actually, if we look at this from a different point of view, it's actually fairly average. Dude, what are you talking about? Well, uh, I actually have some data um, compiled by a really awesome guy. His name is Dave Smigilly. Um, I, I, I can't pronounce his last name. I'm sorry, I'm butchering that. But um, he, he's got a blog at um, jokercluster.blogspot.com. And he's actually gone through and created several charts and graphs based solely on Godzilla's screen time and percentage of the movies he's been in. Dude, that actually sounds kind of cool. Yeah, it is. Um, let's take a look at him real quick. As you can see, uh, if we look at, you know, by percentage, Godzilla in the 2014 movie was only on screen for 8% of the movie. But if we widen our view... To um, for the next few movies that are on this chart, we see that the only movie that actually had a smaller percentage of 6% of Godzilla screen time for the whole movie was Invasion of the Astro Monster, one of my all-time favorite Godzilla movies. And that was only 6% screen time. Next, we have two movies that only had 9% of Godzilla screen time. Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, the very first one. Ghidorah, the three-headed monster, and the original Gojira. He wasn't really... He wasn't really on screen all that much for either of these movies. And if we look at the next increment for 10% of the movie, we see Destroy All Monsters, one of my all-time favorites, along with Gojira and Invasion of the Astro Monster, as well as King Kong vs. Godzilla. And then, if we look at the next uh, one of the next movies, we finally hit something in the Millennium series at 12%, Godzilla Final Wars. And people were complaining that Godzilla was in that one too much. You know, that it was just kind of, an, uh, kind of dumb that Godzilla was doing all this stuff in that movie. Well, 
that's how things go. We can't have a movie based solely on Godzilla on the screen the whole time. In fact, if we look at the um, far far opposite end, at tw the most screen time Godzilla gets is 25% of the movie in Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2. But, now let's look at the secondary graph that he uh, presented us with, which is actual Godzilla's time on screen. Now, you would suspect this had the second, the, probably the second lowest um, actual total screen time. No, because unlike most Godzilla films, the 2014 movie was two hours long. And in fact, Godzilla was on screen for a total of nine minutes and 56 seconds. Which is actually puts him up more screen time than Invasion of the Astro Monster, which only had five minutes and forty three seconds. Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla the first the first time the first movie, The Door of the Three Headed Monster, All Monsters Attack, Destroy All Monsters, Gojira, King Kong vs. Godzilla, Godzilla Reigns Again, and Terror of Mechagodzilla. All of those movies had less Godzilla screen time than the twenty fourteen movie. And it just goes to show you that if we look at this, sort of like dead in the center here, with Abra Horror Over the Deep and Tokyo SOS, the average amount of time Godzilla's on screen is barely 13 minutes. And that's, and you have all these other movies with so little screen time of actual Godzilla, and nobody really complains about those. There's no reason to complain about Godzilla not having that much screen time in this movie because overall it's pretty much exactly the same as most of the core Godzilla movies. In fact, most of my favorites. At its core, Godzilla movies are not entirely about Godzilla. They're about people and Godzilla is a causal element, an effect, something they have to deal with. It's never a movie that's solely about Godzilla smashing things and getting into fights. I mean, that would get boring really quick. It, well, yeah, okay, so... It, I guess I can understand the, the movie time, you know, screen time thing. But what about, what about, what about uh, yeah, what about uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson? Okay, yeah, Aaron Taylor Johnson I don't think was the right person for the role of Ford Brody. I mean, he's a decent actor. He, it's not like he's a bad, per, a bad, a bad pick. He's had some good movies in the past. It's just that I don't think he really knew what he was supposed to do with this part. He kind of played this, you know, stone-faced, rather wooden and rigid and unexpressive guy. You know, admittedly, you know, I, I also will will admit that. um they probably shouldn't have, you know, knocked Brian Cranston out so quick. He was amazing in this film. It was just every time he was on screen, he stole the scene. And I got him. Ken Watanabe was exquisite in this as Doctor Sarazawa. I was really stoked about that. And even Elizabeth Olsen, she, you know, she even though her part was kind of small, she still did an amazing job comparatively. Uh, the only actors that I really made me cringe at all were little kids, and I, I, I have, I've gone on record saying I hate when little kids are in Godzilla movies, and this is no different. When um, Carson Bold was on the screen as Sam, I was like, no, that's not a real little... That's a little kid trying to pretend to be a little kid. Not uh, That's not how little kids act. But, um... Yeah, and of course, though he di didn't, though he didn't do a great job in my opinion, it was still in the portrayal of Ford Brody by Aaron Taylor Johnson was still you know pretty good. I enjoyed it, and you know there's n nothing to really hate about this movie. It did everything that I wanted to see happen, and I'm quite pleased with this. Well, when you put everything that way, I guess it wasn't a horrible movie. I, yeah, thank you, Titanosaurus Plushy. Anyway, guys, I gotta give this movie a solid 4 out of 5. Not the best, but certainly not the worst. A, worth, a, a wonderful attempt by Legendary, and they succeeded. They 
redeemed American Godzilla movies, you know, I'm pretty sure that they've wiped away the stain of that 98 abomination. And with another, uh, the sequel coming out in 2018, and another Godzilla movie being produced by Toho coming out in 2016, just a year away, guys, I'm so excited. It's a really exciting time for us Godzilla fans. Yeah, dude, there's so much co going on, man. It's really cool. Anyway, thanks for watching, everybody. I'm really looking forward to these uh, the upcoming movies in the next few years, and I hope I'm able to enjoy them with all of you. Thank you for watching, and have a wonderful day. Later.